So Harry Potter, right? I've got my Gryffindor colors on today. Wouldn't it be so great if people were actually sorted? The only two houses that really matter are Gryffindor and Slytherin at the end of the day. Like, Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff, like, whatever. Really, humans are really just subdivided between Slytherins and Gryffindor. I don't know what you would call the other ones. Because the Muggles in Harry Potter... So this is the thing about Harry Potter, right? Free will is what separates humans from animals in Dune. That's like the whole Gamja Bar test, right? In Harry Potter, free will is what keeps wizards from muggles. So Dudley Dursley, Dursley he's constantly compared to a pig. It's Harry's cousin. And, you know, Hagrid tries to turn him into a pig, and all that happens is he gets a tail and all that. The muggles are functionally without agency. They have no free will. That's why they're not interesting. Also, the symbol of the wand, it's a classic symbol of agency. And magic is different in Harry Potter. They just point a wand, they say some words, and then it happens. There's, like, no other universe where that was, um, where that was the way magic worked. Um, also, there's an idea, you know, Harry has the lightning bolt scar on his forehead. There's an idea that your prefrontal cortex, the frontal lobe of your brain, is the only part of your brain that can override old conditioning. So if you're acting with free will, it's because you're getting blood to your frontal lobe. If you can't get blood to your frontal lobe, like you're stressed out, you're a conditioned being. You have no real free will. So the fact that Harry's lightning bolt scar is right on his forehead, kind of it, kind of interesting. It's like it's a it's a free will thing. And I don't care what J.K. Rowling intended. I actually think that the intention of the artist doesn't really get you that far because people tap into this dormant body of subconscious symbols and ideas, you know, the collective unconscious and all that. So Harry's, um, he has three proxy fathers. They're all named for stages in alchemy. The first book's all about alchemy. Uh, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Sorcerer's Stone, it's all about alchemy. Really, the whole series is, and the thing that made me realize the whole series was about alchemy was the third book, actually, with the Dementors. When you really think about that, the way to, the way to, um, or not the Dementors, the Bogarts, the way to disarm a Bogart is to laugh at it, and bar Bogarts take on whatever you're afraid of. That's like, that's spiritually alchemical, like that idea that you, you laugh at things that you're afraid of, you level up. But the first book especially, it's all about alchemy. Um, Dumbledore is, you know, Albus Dumbledore. Albus means white. Rubius Hagrid. Rubius, Rubius means red. Sirius Black means black. Uh, all three of them are present in the first chapter of the first book. Which is interesting. Um, Sirius Black technically isn't present, but he's mentioned. And, um, you know, so Hagrid's the red, he's the, the passionate, the emotion, he's the lord of the forest. This is what J.K. Rowling even said. Dumbledore is the spiritual theoretician. Uh, he's brilliant, he's idealized, he's somewhat detached. And the idea of, you know, you can look into Psychology and Alchemy by Jung if you're interested. You know, there, there is... Jung said, actually, that the continuation of Christian mysticism that was alchemy, was carried on in the subterranean darkness of the unconscious. That's kind of what Harry Potter is. Harry Potter's pretty Christian. There's a lot of themes. Um, she, Harry's a Christ archetype. The lightning bolt scar. Lightning is an act of God. It's a force of nature. And that, so that kind of tells you what saved him. And it's true. If you, if you read, you know, they kind of could have told you in the first book, but don't make me edit this. They could have told you this in the first book, but they waited till the seventh to like fully explain it. The reason why Harry survived Voldemort is because his mom sacrificing her life for him was an ancient form of magic that um saved his life. There's just there's a whole lot of gravy in Harry Potter. It's a really um uh, you know the the first act of magic in Harry Potter, the vanishing glass, is super interesting. Because what happens, right? He goes to the zoo with uh, his cousin. Dudley's, like, counting his presents and stuff, complaining that he has two less presents than he had the year before. And then they go to the zoo. They take Harry to the zoo, even though they don't want to. And 
Uh, Harry's just super grateful. He's like so happy to be at the zoo, even though he's being horribly mistreated by the people who brought him there. And they go into the reptile house. There's the boa constrictor. It's asleep. And Dudley gets bored. He walks away. Harry starts talking to the snake. So that's one thing. And then Dudley comes back because the snake's awake. And he like elbows Harry in the ribs. And when Harry falls down, the glass disappears. So Harry, subconsciously and without meaning to, removes the barrier between his piggish animal cousin and the symbol of the ancient animal mind. So he removes the barrier between Dudley and the thing that offered mankind the choice to have free will in the first place, in the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil. It's interesting, right? Like, she, she clearly knows what's up. It's very alchemical story all all the parts of it snakes are also a, a symbol of the the prima materia in alchemy which is the um you know it's it's the any any creation myth has the prima materia in it it's the unformed dark chaos that precedes life and order but you know people like the muggles in harry potter they people like their slavery they fear agency they'll choose the government or an abusive past, or a relationship, or a mandate, whatever the heck that is. They'll choose their job. They'll choose any reason at all to say, here, take my agency. I don't want it. This is the Dursleys, right? Free will scares people. Uh, what other gravy is there in Harry Potter? Uh, t -t -t I mean, when, it, when the, like, the whole you're a wizard Harry scene, really what the line in that, that's, that chapter that's actually really means something is when Haggard says to Harry you don't know what you are because that's everybody people the world makes people forget what they are uh Malfoy is interesting because he's an entitled narcissist he's very narcissistic you know he's like oh my father is getting my books and my my mother is looking at wands for me and everything you know he's he's the opposite of the Weasley family he's like a single child with these rich parents the Weasleys have seven kids and they're poor um, I think J.K. Rowling has said that the theme of the books was racism, which makes no sense to me, actually. Um, I'm not going to get into that, but I could explain why that makes no sense. Instead, what I, I, what I will do is tell you what I think the books are actually about. They're about the hoarding of sacred knowledge. And that's what Malfoy's family wants to do, right? They want to keep knowledge away from people. They don't like the Muggleborns. So they don't like it when agency spontaneously appears in the child of a Muggle. You know, Muggleborn is a witch or a wizard born to a Muggle family. Blah, blah, blah. Muggle means non-magical. It's probably derived from Mugwort, which is just a weird magic-y plant. And the effect of... So the Malfoy family and all these dark wizards, they have agency. They have free will. They have wands. But they choose the dark path. And there's something about that dark path that degenerates them. And it makes them more animal-like. It's almost like they're choosing to become more like the Dursleys in a way. Um, this goes along with like desecration of the flesh and things like that. You see that with um, Quirrell at the end of the book, the end of the first book. Um, he's having... Voldemort lives literally in the back of his head. Like, his, his head is Voldemort's face. And... You know, so Voldemort is quite literally the, the voice in the back of his head. It's really clever writing. Um, the reason why Malfoy hates Harry, by the way, something kind of interesting. It's not because Malfoy's dad was a Death Eater and his mom is named Narcissa and he's just plain awful. It's actually because it's, it's like an interesting personality quirk. He goes up to Harry on the Hogwarts Express when they're on their way to Hogwarts for the first time. And he says to him, you know, some wizarding families are better than others. He's talking about the Weasleys, the, the poor red-headed Weasleys. You don't want to go making friends with the wrong sort. I can help you there. And he reaches out to shake Harry's hand. And Harry's like, I can, I can figure it out myself, thanks. And uh, this is why Malfoy doesn't like Harry. Uh, it's, not because, it's not because Harry's good and, and Malfoy's bad. It's because Malfoy wants Harry. He wants access to that specialness. That is Harry Potter, the boy who lived. And not only does Harry refuse, he refuses in favor of the friendship of a Weasley, right? 
So Malfoy's a jerk. He looks down on Hagrid. He looks down on the Weasleys. Um, what else is there? There's some good stuff in this book. The Mirror of Erized. That's another really good one. Uh, da, da, da. So the Mirror of Erized. It's desire spelled backwards, right? You look in the Mirror of Erized. You see the deepest, most desperate desire of your heart reflected back at you. Um, so this is interesting. This is this is like the mirror of your eyes. That is an alchemical an alchemical puzzle. It's a spiritual trap. So desire indicates a lot about your spiritual state, and it's kind of a slippery slope. In Eastern alchemy, it's actually all about forsaking desire, right? Like desire is suffering, that kind of thing. And you know, um, it's appropriate that at the end of the book, when Harry's finally going after the Sorcerer's Stone, the mirror of your eyes shows up. And there's that alchemical puzzle of desire again that they have to grapple with to get the stone. It's it's, it's pretty genius, to be honest. It's if if you reinterpret Harry Potter really as Harry Potter is this alchemical master. He's this enlightened spirit. That's why like like his gratitude when he's at the zoo, um, like with with the his jerk family. It's it's really phenomenal. <laughs> I get why people don't think she wrote the books. I think she probably did, but, you know. Oh, another thing about the mirror of Erised, if people don't realize it, when Harry looks in the mirror, he sees his family, right? He sees himself surrounded by his, his mom, his dad, his grandparents, aunts, uncles. When Ron looks in the mirror of Erised, he sees himself special. He sees, he's head boy, he's got the Quidditch cup, he's, he's, the, he's holding the house cup. He's, so when Ron looks in the mirror, he sees what Harry has. When Harry looks in the mirror, he sees what Ron has. That's the yin and yang of Harry and Ron's relationship. There's a lot of really subtle, psychic kind of balances in Harry Potter that makes it really potent. It makes it really good, really engaging storytell storytelling. And they're almost all, like, unconscious things. Uh, the, when Harry goes into the Forbidden Forest at the end, right? The Into the Woods scene, there's always one. Um, and he meets the centaurs. The centaurs, they're, they're trying to figure out what's killing the unicorns because there's unicorn blood everywhere. And the centaurs keep saying, well, you know, they're not telling them why the centaurs or the unicorns are getting murdered. What they do say is, Mars is bright tonight. Mars is kind of bright tonight. And they just keep saying that. And Haggard's like losing his mind because he doesn't understand what it means. And, you know. It's the first scene that Harry meets Voldemort and Mars is the planet of war, blah, blah, blah. The thing about this scene, I really love that chapter. It's one of my favorites, partly because it freaked me out as a kid. There's that whole thing about drinking unicorn blood. And, um, you know, it's a lot like in the movie Legend with Tim Curry. He plays the, uh, the Lord of Darkness and he wants the symbol of purity and the symbol of innocence that is the unicorn slaughtered. He has his minions bring him unicorn horns. It's kind of like that in Harry Potter, where um, Voldemort's inhabiting Quirrell's body, Professor Quirrell, who wears this bizarre turban to, to hide the fact that Voldemort's on the back of his head. And, you know, he's drinking this unicorn blood. The, uh, the centaur explains, the blood of a unicorn will keep you alive, even if you are an inch from death, but at a terrible price. You have slain something pure and defenseless to save yourself, and you will have but a half-life. A cursed life. This is adrenochrome. This is drinking the blood of children. It's, it's that. This is the, the mechanism by which evil works. The fact that that's pointed out so directly and early on in Harry Potter is really interesting to me. That destruction of innocence. Um... And people seem to know things about, like, horcruxes, like, uh, Hagrid says in the first book, he doesn't know if Voldemort had enough human left in him to die. So it's, it's hard for me to tell what has seeped into the public consciousness about Harry Potter and what hasn't. So, and Coral has this horrifying relationship with Voldemort, right? You find that out at the end of the book, and, you know, it's, it's, it goes along with that whole desecration of the flesh thing. So... Throughout the book, you hear, like, Quirrell whimpering, things like that. He's actually doing blood sacrifices for Voldemort. And, you know, he's he's the rube. He's the fall guy. He's this chump that Voldemort has possessed. 
Nobody, nobody wins with you. Can, you don't win a deal with the devil ever. And that's basically the, the story of Quirrell, right? He's, um, he goes on his little rant with Harry too. You know, a foolish young man I was then, full of ridiculous ideas about good and evil. Lord Voldemort showed me how wrong I was. There is no good and evil. There is only power and those too weak to seek it. I hear people say this a lot, actually, that there's no good and evil and it's just, you know, it's just power, whatever, whatever in their mind is the thing. And I, I can't help but notice that the people who tend to say this, they seem a little bit like, uh, I don't know, evil. So there is good and evil. Um, Voldemort's a bad guy. His followers are bad guys. I don't want to spoil it for you. Evil people end up debasing themselves and sharing their headspace, literally in the case of Quirrell, with what are essentially demonic entities. And it usually is because of some thirst for power. And Voldemort eventually leaves Quirrell to die. You know, he doesn't care about his followers. He'll betray you on the drop of a hat. Like, you know, Dracula betrays Renfield in the story. All this, there's no loyalty amongst thieves. Um, so yeah, uh, this is fun. Um, I have lots of thoughts about Harry Potter. Have a good day. Don't go sharing your head with any evil entities. And I'll see you guys next time.